acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. You're awake. Nice. I like that. This morning's lesson is actually three different little stories all packed into one. But first we have to understand a few things. What day did this reading happen? It actually happened on two days. But I heard the answer over here. Easter. It starts on Easter because it says the night, that night. Right? And what just happened before this? Mary went to the tomb and saw the tomb was empty. Went back, told the disciples. The disciples ran to look. Met Jesus in the garden. And then that night, the disciples are locked in the upper room for fear that what's going to happen to them. And Jesus appears to them and he says, Shalom. Which actually translates to peace. Right? Shalom is the Hebrew word for peace, but it's also just a natural Hebrew greeting. So was Jesus actually saying peace or was he saying, hello? I would say he's saying peace because he says it again, right? He shows them then what? The holes in his hands and his side. And he says to them, peace be with you. Because they didn't really get it, right? They saw Jesus. He said, peace be with you. And they didn't know who he was until he showed them the holes in his hands and the holes in his side. And then they rejoiced because they knew that it was Jesus. It's like, did they not just get the fact that Mary told them that she saw him? Peter and the disciple that Jesus loves went to the tomb and found it empty. We don't know where Jesus is. But here we get the second appearance, right? Jesus first appears to Mary. And then he appears to the ten disciples. Why ten? Judas is no longer a disciple because he's no longer with them because he's dead. And Thomas is missing. So there's ten disciples in this upper room, and he appears to them, and he says to them, Look, here I am. Everything's okay. As the Father sent me, so I'm now going to send you out into the world to do something for me. Right? And then he says to them, Any sins that you forgive are forgiven, and any sins that you retain are retained. Right? He says there in verse 23. This is a hard verse to understand. I think we need to look at this a little bit because it, this is what Jesus sends each and every one of us to do. Right? You know that you have the power to forgive sin. Did you know that? You have the power to forgive sin. And according to the way that this verse is translated, you also have the power to keep somebody in their sin. Think about that for a moment. But think about that. I honestly can say, and I hope all of you would honestly say the same thing with me, you don't want me to have the power to forgive you of your sin or to allow you to stay in your sin. Because that's an awesome power to have and to hold. Charmaine's struggling with this a little bit, and that's fine. See, that's what we have to understand about this verse. Because <laughs> this verse literally says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. In 2010, Sandra Schneider gave an address to the Catholic Biblical Association. It was the presidential address. And on that, she, she talked about the translation here of John chapter 20, verse 23b, which is tradition, traditionally translated and understood that there is a second occurrence of the word sin. Right? If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Actually, in the, in the Greek, that second word for sin is not there. The verse actually reads, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you hold fast to anyone, they are held fast. It doesn't say anything about not being able to forgive sins. And Sandra Schneider comments on this a little bit more, and she says, and I quote, a more adequate reading would be the following. Of whomever you forgive the sins, the, they, the sins, are forgiven of, to them. And whomever you hold fast or embrace, they are held fast. In other words, 
The sins in the first member are possessed by the forgiven. Right? The person who does the sins is the one who has the sins. It is the person, not the sins in the second member, who are the object of what is grasped or what is held. So if I see you and I can't forgive you of your sins, I hold you fast to what it is that I see that you're doing wrong and help you understand that. Right? That's the difference here. There is actually, in the Greek, no word for forgiven. The two words in this text are afiame, which is the word translated as forgiven, and prateo, which means to retain or to hold fast. If I do this with my fist, I'm prateoing my fist. I'm holding it fast. I'm retaining it. I'm keeping it tight. But if I open it up and I let it go, then it's gone. The word afiemo means to let it go. I promised myself I wouldn't break into song every time I said that this morning. Right? And you have to have both of these words in order for it to work together. You see, maybe God is the only one who can actually forgive us of our sins. But I, as someone who has been empowered and given the Holy Spirit, which each and every one of us have, right? Christ said to the disciples, peace be with you. And then he did what? He breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Just as all of the church did at the day of Pentecost. You have within you the power that resided within Christ when he walked on this earth. I got goosebumps when I just said that. I don't know if that affects any of you the same way. You have the power within you to do everything that Christ did when he was here. Because God gave it to you. You have the power to tell someone that their past sins can no longer dictate what their future will be. You have the power to help someone see what they're doing that is wrong within the eyes of God and help them understand that and help them work towards that, that line of being right with God and being able to let go of what has kept them there. Right? That class fist is what we try to hold on to. Christ holds everyone accountable. He doesn't turn a blind eye. Even in all of the accounts in the Gospel of John where he says your sins are forgiven, like the woman caught in the act of adultery, which is actually in Luke. What does he say to her? The, the Pharisees bring this woman to Jesus. Jesus is drawing in the sand. And, and they say, we want a stoner. And he says, let the first one among you without sin cast the first stone. And then he says, woman, where are your accusers? Because they'd all have left. And he said, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Your past doesn't control what your future will be. It's about telling people that their past lives don't have to hold them captive. The things that we've done don't have to keep us in a prison. You are allowed to let it go and to be who Christ has called you to be within him. Christ did that. He gives you the power to do that and calls for us to do that. That's what those words mean. And then who shows up a week later? Right? Because it says the next week they were gathered together again and... Thomas was there, and Jesus said to him, here they are, you wanted to see them and put your hands in them. Does he? Actually, we don't know. The correct answer is we don't know if he did or not. But he says, my Lord and my God, and he worships Jesus because he had the exact same thing that Mary had, when the disciples probably didn't believe Mary. The same thing that the ten had when, when Thomas didn't believe them. Right? You've all been to those places, right? Where you go and tell your friends, you've really got to go and see this. Because you can't know what it is like until you've experienced it yourself. And that's what Thomas wanted. And that's what Thomas got. And Jesus said to him, what did he say? It's in your reading. Don't. Doubt, but believe. He didn't actually say doubt. Here's the next thing that I want you to hear this morning, and I want you to understand that, that I have doubted. 
I doubted this stuff that's in that book. I doubted that God was going to be there. I doubted that things were going to be able to work out right. I doubted that things were going to be okay. And I still do that today. And you know what? That's not bad. Because our God is big enough to take our doubts. Our God is big enough to understand our questions. Our God is big enough to walk with us and to kreato us, hold us fast, even when we are maybe stumbling or falling. <laughs> to hold tight to what he loves, to hold tight to who he owns. The word there is epistos. It's Jesus literally said to Thomas, don't, he said epistos a la pistos, which means don't be unbelieving, but believing. Don't be untrusting, but trusting. Don't be unfaithful, but faithful. You see, Jesus never told Thomas not to doubt. He never told the disciples not to question. He told them to be trusting, to believe that what Jesus had said was going to be true. Because look, I told you guys all along, I was going to have to die. And after three days, I was going to rise again. And here I am. It's all been done. You can trust everything that was told to you. And then he says, John says, everything is written in this book so that you may come to believe. Because there's other things that Jesus did. The, the disciple that, that Jesus loved wrote all of these things down so that we could understand who Christ was. Because that's what we have to see, right? Do we get to see Jesus? That's a, actually a trick question. <laughs> really, we don't. Like Mary and the eleven and all the other people that Jesus appeared to. They walked with him here on earth. After he died, they thought he was gone forever. He reappeared to them as himself in bodily form and showed them that the promises that God said were true. But John wrote these things down so that we could come to see Christ too. We could have that experience and understand that Jesus is who he said he was. A lot of other stuff was done, but we don't need to know any of that. We don't need to know whether or not Thomas put his hands in the hole. Not important. What we need to know is what's written in this book. This book. And that's why we do this. Every Sunday morning where we gather and we talk about passages from this book. Because it's not just about certain parts of it. It's about the whole thing. Because Martin Luther said that the Bible is the cradle in which the Christ child is laid. Meaning that every passage within this book has something to do with Jesus. And all of this book is good for us to understand how Jesus came to be here and did what he did. That Jesus came, empowered us, filled us with his spirit and sent us into the world so that we too can help people see that their past lives don't have to control their futures. That their past lives don't have to dictate who they're going to be tomorrow. Christ did that for all of us. And he asks us to do that for the world. And he fills you with the Spirit and sends you in his love. So as we go out this Easter season, let us remember that. And let us also rejoice that Christ is always with us. Because he's filled us with his Spirit, giving us his power. Empowering us and enabling us to go into the world to help people see that their lives don't have to be dictated by who they were. But by who God says they can be.